I'm not necessarily a crier. I was like wiping away some some tears almost at the end, seeing how much it meant to yeah. Novak Djokovic. Hi everyone and welcome to The French Connection. It is our last one, but it is brought to you by NBC Sports and Racket. We have been here covering all the tennis from the French Open right through, of course, to the Olympics in Paris. It is me and that guy over there, Sam Query. What's up, mate? We gotta get to the Olympics, my friend. I know, I'm excited. It was an unbelievable Olympics, not only for tennis, but for all sports. Yeah, I, I got I got to tell you, um, me covering it, that's my fourth uh, Olympics that I've covered um, for NBC with the tennis. I went to four Olympics, so that's eight, so it's been a few. Um, but I have to say, Paris really turned it on. I, I mean, I don't know how in God's green earth, LA, and then after that, Brisbane, are going to top all of the beautiful structures. And what we saw in Paris was just phenomenal. Um, but let's get to it the tennis before we, you know, really start capturing our favorite parts of the Olympics. Novak Djokovic, are you surprised by his gold medal uh, win over Carlos Alcaraz, Sam? I'm not, I may be a little bit surprised. I mean, it was incredible to have Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz playing the final. There's one thing that Novak Djokovic didn't have, a gold medal. And you can see, I mean, watching the match, I remember watching with my wife and telling her in late in that second set, that Novak is putting every ounce of his mental energy, his physical energy into this match right now. I think he needed to win that second set. And no. you saw when he won that match, the emotional energy that that like spewed out of his body. Um, it was a really special thing to see. It was one of the coolest moments as like a tennis fan to watch that I've ever had to see what that meant to him. You could see that it meant more to him than some other grand slams that he's won in the past. So it was a, a special moment. I was so happy for him. And you were there. Were you commentating that? I was. Yeah. yeah. It yeah, was. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'll be honest. It was, you know, one of my coolest moments as, as a, as a commentator working in the sport um, to be able to call that final with Alcaraz and Djokovic was, you know, it was a, it was a, to call it with Mary Carrillo was pretty, pretty, pretty special. You know, we didn't have to do much. We just sat back and watched two of the greatest. You know, Carlos Alcaraz arguably going to be one of the greats of the game. We'll see how many Grand Slam he ends up with um, by the end of his career. Um, but Novak, just what he was able to do. Sam, I was more, like, overwhelmed when I saw him win the semifinal. When he won the semifinal, he, I mean, you saw his vulnerabilities throughout this tournament because matches that he, even when he played Rafa, when he was up a set and 4-1, two breaks, you're like, oh, it's over. And then he visibly choked. Like he played some shocking tennis and we're not used to that from him. And then in the semifinals to see him like go to the ground and like gesture the way he did to make a final we don't see that from him and he said it after the match where he's like I finally get a chance to play for a gold because he's never played for a gold in all his fifth Olympics that's how much it meant to him I mean incredible effort in the end from him uh, just unbelievable and he played so solid and I thought the one thing I don't know about you I thought the one thing Alcaraz the mistake he made he didn't step up on return I thought he was playing way too deep on the second serve in particular. And you know what this feels like. I mean, you don't because you had such a great serve. But the vulnerability of Novak's second serve sometimes is in question, right? And yep. I felt like Alcaraz wasn't putting any pressure on it whatsoever. And he was hitting like 70 mile an hour second serves just in the middle of the box. And it wasn't getting punished. And I think in the end, that, that hurt Alcaraz. And Novak standing up on the baseline, even though it was hurting him through the set because he couldn't get the kicker, that's what helped him in the big moments. It was amazing how he turned it around in the tiebreak, just one or two little points that ended up winning him the match. No, I think I think you're spot on. It was pretty cool to see with an athlete. I feel like the entire year Novak was telling us, look, my goal this year is to get a gold medal. And then to go out there and not have a great year in terms of Novak standard and then get to the Olympics and fight through some of those tough matches along the way to the gold medal and then to actually get the gold medal, do that thing that you've been telling people the whole year that like, hey, this is the number one thing I want to accomplish was an amazing thing to see. And I, I, I said this on a you know another podcast earlier in the week. Like, I'm not necessarily a crier. I was like wiping away some some tears almost at the end, seeing how much it meant to yeah. Novak Djokovic. Yeah, yeah, amazing. I mean, he joins now an exclusive club of uh, gold medal champions in singles because because you know Rafa um, won it in singles and doubles. Steffi, of course, did what 
we probably will never see in, in anyone's lifetime winning all four Grand Slams and then winning the gold medal. But Novak joins, you know, Andre Agassi, the likes of these players. Um, and Roger Federer is not even on that list. Although Roger won a gold medal in doubles, he never did this in singles. And so that's something that uh, I'm sure Novak is really happy that he's got over Roger as <laughs> <Yeah>. well. <laughs> People don't care, though. We always, my friends and I always joke, if you're an Olympic gold medalist, may that be in in doubles, mixed doubles, singles, or you're on the men's Mixed, water polo yeah. team, women's basketball yeah. team. When you're announced at an event, you're just announced as a gold medalist. That's they don't right. specify the event that you that you won. So, you know, yes, the tennis insiders know that Novak has the singles and Roger has the doubles, but the world just knows they both have a gold. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, talk to the Novak and, and Roger fans about that because they'll, they'll let you know exactly how they feel. Right. Um, <laughs> So Rafael Nadal, he's you know he's confirmed out of the Olympics um, that uh, he won't be playing the U.S. Open. I'm just curious on your thoughts. Where does this go now for 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 Rafa? Uh, you know, because I, I mean, I didn't think he was pl going to play the U.S. Open, but but what is there left for him now to do? He's playing the Labor Cup, but what what do we expect here? <sighs> I don't know. You know, it's like it, we've kind of been wondering this, talking about this. I feel like since the French Open, which was gosh, the first week of June. So it's we're coming on three months now of is Rafa done? Is Rafa not done? Um, you know, I think he said he's going to play in the Labor Cup. Yeah. Is that going to be his last event? Does he want to go leave the same way Roger left? I, I kind of want him to have his last tournament be a different one than Roger. But I I think he's still unsure, and I, I kind of feel for him at this point. I, I think yeah. so much of him wants to keep playing. He's obviously passionate about tennis, loves the game, but he just doesn't know how his body's going to react day to day. And he's hopefully he gets a, a sign at some point from his body, from his his mind, his friends and family, because I, I want him to get uh, you know that closure that he hopefully deserves. Yeah, it's a it's a really tough one. Um, obviously, we saw you know some players at the at the Olympics. I'll, I'll get to that um, when we wrap up the Olympics a little bit. But um, yeah, it was it was pretty incredible to see him play in the singles and the doubles. Um, you know, it's a shame that he had to play Novak second round. But but yeah, this is where do we go from here with Nadal? Clearly, hard court is a big issue for him. You know, for his body. So clearly, that's why one of the reasons he's not playing on the hard court. But you can't wait for a year for clay. I mean, so right. the next question is, where does he go out? Like you said, um, and hopefully it's uh, in, a, in a way that he wants it to be. That and it's way. a little surprising to me that he he pulled out, he made the announcement of not playing the U.S. Open so far ahead of the U.S. Open. Four or five weeks prior to the U.S. Open said, I'm not going to play. Who? You don't know how you're going to feel in five weeks. Maybe he's going to feel good and he could play. But obviously his body's telling him he can't do it. And so it's a it's a bummer for everyone. Yeah, um, we'll wait and see. Uh, fingers crossed uh, at some point we're going to know um, pretty soon. Um, what do you think of the exchange of the Emma Navarro situation at the Olympics uh, with uh, Chin Wen? I mean, it was bizarre. And I was doing that match and I actually commented after the shake of hands, oh, that's nice that they had a nice moment at the net. Like, it looked like they were just chatting. But it was a little ugly there. Uh, I don't know, Sam, what your thoughts are on this. But um, it was very interesting because... I've not heard uh, in the locker room that Zhang isn't a bad person in the locker room. So, I mean, obviously I haven't been in the locker room in a while, but um, that's that was an interesting situation for Emma Navarro, who's usually so laid back and chill. Right. Both players, you don't hear much from either of them ever. Yeah. You're right. They're both quiet, especially in Emma Navarro. She is the most maybe, you know, her and Jessica Pagula, you see them, you don't see them have extreme highs, extreme lows, very level-headed. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting. The entire... U.S. women's team. You saw a little fight from Navarro. Coco Goff had some fight. Daniel Collins always has a little <laughs> drama of sorts. You know, I think Jessica Pagula maybe le felt left out. She was the only one that didn't have an altercation on the uh, Team USA women. But, uh, you know, I think it's something that was just a, a, a little moment. I think it's it's past kind of now. No one's going to talk about it. But, it. but it was surprising, especially since Emma Navarro is, seems like the most quiet, sweetest, calmest, kind of one of the female players on the tour right now. Yeah, exactly. And obviously uh, it, she spurred on Chin Win to go and win a gold medal, which was phenomenal. Um, I just really quick want to touch on um, that situation. I mean, going through and winning the gold medal, beating Iga Shriantek that we didn't th think was possible to right. actually beat someone like Iga at the 
at the French Open, uh, you know, where we played the French Open, where she's undefeated over the last like three years and she's won the tournament four times there. So that was a spectacular win for her. But also I wanted, you know, a lot of pressure on Iga Shiontek to, to win the gold there. I mean, that, that was like Rafa at his prime, not winning a gold medal at Roland Garros if they had the Olympics him in singles. So that was a bit of a shock. But congrats to her to, to get through and win, not only beat Iga, but then to follow it up in the final against uh, Donna Vekic, who also amazing month of tennis for her, semis of Wimbledon and finals of the Olympics. So it was a pretty spectacular tournament on the women's side. Just a lot, lot, lot more, as per usual, unexpected finalists. Right. And to win the final, after beating Iga Svantec, it's almost tougher sometimes to win that final. Yeah. You beat Iga Svantec, who everyone had penciled in to win the gold medal. Yeah. And then you go into the gold medal match as the overwhelming favorite and to, to come, maybe not overwhelming, but heavy favorite and to come through and, and win that after winning a big match. You know what it's like after you have a big upset in a tournament. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. that next match is the hardest one. So it was, you know, good on her for focusing, digging down and finishing what she started winning that gold medal. Yeah, totally. All right. What were some of your favorite moments uh, from the Olympics, uh, Sam? Um, are we talking all sports right all now? Sports. Yeah, yeah. We're talking all sports. You know, I'm I'm an I'm a purist that likes the the swimming, the gymnastics, the the javelin, the long jump, the track and field. I like those Olympic sports that we've that have seemingly been around for 500 years. Um, but the track and field is probably my favorite. I, I love especially the relay races, passing the baton. But you know, every night I love turning on. You know, NBC 8 p.m. We had the the two hour show, and so. They did a great job of kind of jumping around from sport to sport. And I don't know why we kind of touched on it earlier. This Olympics felt bigger. I know a ton of, we had the, a crowd. the crowds were huge. It didn't matter what sport you turned on. You could turn on yeah. break dancing, you know, beach volleyball, the biking. And it was just packed with people. And anytime a sport or a crowd or a stadium is packed, it kind of intrigues you more. So even if it wasn't a sport that you were necessarily into, call it fencing but the crowd is packed you yeah. kind of in your mind are like i gotta i gotta watch this a little bit why are all these people watching i need to watch but the coverage was amazing and um you know los angeles has a lot to live up to now yeah they do um i was thinking where are they going to put the horse riding when they have it in versailles in right. paris did you I go mean, watch a lot of other sports while you were so, there so um you know obviously super busy during the tennis um not able to go and see anything but um i will tell you that i went to paris and saw the Beach volleyball was unbelievable. I mean, with, with the, the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower, Tower in the background, right? By, I sat in the stand and I went, "This is absolutely bonkers." <laughs> I've never seen a more beautiful setting in my entire life. It was just unreal. Um, I would kind of be mad if I'm another one of the other athletes. Like, why did the beach you, volleyball you get this setting? <laughs> Exactly, uh, because it's incredibly popular. And uh, well, the way they had it set up is that a lot of, and you've been to Paris many, many times. But if you walk down the towards the Place de la Concorde from the Arc de Triomphe, like all the way down there, they have those beautiful open gardens near the Louvre. Yeah. What they did is they set aside all a lot of the different, um, you know, venues along the River Seine. So it was incredible the way they did it because they do have a lot of space, believe it or not, in that area of, um, you know essentially downtown Paris. They have right, these beautiful yeah. gardens and things. So they set up a lot of the um, the, the, the games um, along the River Seine. So that was amazing. So you had just people walking up and down the river, up and down the, you know, the most amazing iconic streets in Paris. So it was incredible. And I went to the uh, women's basketball between the US and Australia, which was also amazing. Um, the atmosphere there was incredible. So I just thought Paris was incredible. One thing that I love was the Andy Murray story with Dan Evans. Those guys survived Great. so many match points outside of other sports. That was an iconic storyline for me. But I was obsessed with the swimming, clearly. I mean, paying attention to calling tennis and then having a little sneaky look on Peacock on the cable uh, on my phone, <laughs> right. what was happening in the swimming at the same time. I'm not going to lie. I was watching a lot of that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there were just – there were so many – for Australia, we had our most successful Olympic Games ever. Um, seeing the co uh, the uh, Fox sisters win gold medals, each of them, and one of them knocked cool. one of them out in the semifinals just to get there. It was like the Williams sisters of uh, kayaking. It was incredible. So yeah, <laughs> you know, I know what you mean. No, it was it was incredible. I, hopefully, people kind of talk about these other sports for the next four years to kind of keep the momentum going until the uh, twenty twenty eight Olympics in Los Angeles. Yeah, exactly. Um, just storyline upon storyline. So, yeah, Simone Biles coming back, doing what she did, and just 
all the detractors, all the haters. I just think about the people that were online when she pulled out in Tokyo because she didn't want to kill herself. Like literally, you know, like it's a right. dangerous sport to be in the air and have the twisties and not know where you are in the air and come back and do what she did. And I just think about the people that called her weak back in you 2020. You still even see at the Olympics now, like when the when the females are doing, you know, the double bars of the vault, their coaches are still there sometimes supporting them in case yeah. of a fall. Like, you, I mean – if you land funny on your neck or your back, like it's going to be not good. Trouble. I'll no, say that. Yeah. It's going to be not good. So anyway, I was just thrilled for her that she was able to, I actually flew back from Paris. Um, her dad was on my flight. <laughs> so there you, you go. Talk to him? Uh, yeah, I did talk to him. We were talking about um, how long it was taking to get our bags off the flight. Um, so okay. we did have a good chat about that. No Olympic um, talk, just luggage yeah, talk. Just, no, just Delta luggage. luggage talk. No, yeah, yeah. It was another airline actually, but anyway. All right. So, of course, the Olympics is over. We can't wait, as we said. Um, and I think there's a lot of players. Uh, Daria Saville wrote on her Twitter page, watching the end of the Olympics makes me want to practice harder so I can get on the team in four years. I mean, everyone thinks that way because this Olympics was so incredible. So congrats to everybody and, and everybody at NBC because I know the hours that they put in were just tremendous. Um, so everybody at NBC, Molly Solomon um, in particular, who's um, the boss, congrats on everything. All right, it's time to get to hardcourt season, Sam. Um, what a turnaround for some of these players, and we've already seen some upsets, and particularly from players that have come from Paris that didn't get the preparation on hardcourt have lost in this tournament already in Cincinnati. Um, Taylor Fritz for one, Tommy Paul, another one. Um, but um, I want to talk, before we get to sort of that situation, there's a bit of, been a bit of an interesting situation with the electronic line calling, speaking of Taylor Fritz the other day, um, when he lost his match against Brendan. Uh, he, he said, look, he said that it had nothing to do with the outcome of the match. But there was a ball that was about this far out, and the electronic line calling didn't pick it up, and they kept playing. So he hit... I think, I believe three more shots. They both hit yep. about three more shots after that. And then the word of God said, stop, stop, stop. Now, I want to know from your perspective, you know, people are like, I thought you said it was, you know, 100% accurate. I never said it was 100% accurate. But I feel like, and as you would feel like, players feel like it's going to be the same for both players no matter what, right? So what do you think about that situation and um, just overall in general? Yeah, nothing's ever going to be 100% accurate. And it just kind of messed up by not making the out call. It still made it. It still let the players and the umpire and the fans know that the ball was out. It accurately yeah. accurately notified people the ball was out. Yeah. Once that happened, the umpire should have gone, "Hey Taylor, hey Brandon, that ball from three shots ago was out. Here's the proof. Here's the the video evidence, and the point should have been awarded to Taylor. It's so 100%. obvious. And I even, it's tough in the moment. I even maybe feel like Brandon Nakashima should have said, "All right, no no problem, Taylor, your point." Yeah. It's I don't actually think it's Brandon's job to do that. I think it's the umpire's job to stand up and make the right decision and say, "Hey, that's Taylor's point." I maybe internally at the ATP and WTA they hadn't thought about this type of scenario if it happened. I think moving forward they would do that and and make the change and say, "Hey, if the if Hawkeye doesn't correctly call a ball in or out and the point somehow continues, we're going to go back to whatever call should have been made." Yeah. Uh it, it was unfortunate. Like Taylor said, it didn't affect the outcome of the match. Yeah, because he the, won the next point. He won the next point, and it was – I think it was early in the second set. Yeah. But, the you know, with the ATP or the umpire, whoever's in charge of making that decision moving forward needs to come up with a, a kind of a black and white decision on how that's going to be handled, and it's not the way they handled it currently. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand how – I mean, clearly a precedent has been set now, right? But, right. you know, for the umpire to say something as, I mean, I'm just going to flat out say it, as dumb as you should, well, you should have stopped the point. It's like, wait, I'm not going to stop the point. Stop it's electronic it. sign. Right. I'm like, surprised the supervisor didn't come out and say, hey, guys, this is Taylor's point. Yeah. Like the ball was out and the, the machine's messed up. So sorry that happened. But it's Taylor's point. The ball was out. Yeah, the ball was out. I, I just It's mind-boggling to me. But anyway, as we said, hopefully a precedent has been set. They've talked about it afterwards. If this happens again and the word of God says stop, 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 because that did not come from the umpire. They came from like some electronic thing. Um, it should have just been right away. Mistake was made. No problem. Move on. And then we wouldn't have even had any of these problems. But I guess things like this have to happen for rules to be implemented, and hopefully the rule will be implemented going exactly. forward. Exactly. You can't think of every scenario on what's going to happen in sports with with Hawkeye or a player going to the restroom or whatever the, the random scenarios are. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you're going to have these one-off 
lessons that you're going to learn. It's how you react to things. So hopefully the ATP WTA reacts to it in the right way and makes the proper changes going forward. Yeah, because it will happen again. And like I said, you know, to people on like social media that were like, Renee, you always say that electronic line calling is great and, and it is great. <laughs> and, you know, you and I both know if I'd had it in my time, the less stress on me, like knowing that an umpire didn't screw up a call or a linesman didn't screw up a call. You would have had 10 like, more grand slams had you had I electronic line calling. definitely had less gray hair. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, and I would have probably had a lot less therapy. But anyway, um, another thing that's really interesting about what's happening, um, just we'd like to talk about the stuff just necessarily not always about the tennis, is this fan abuse that's happening. Okay, there was situations, for example, in uh, Europe this year when Danielle Collins had a go at, remember when she had, if you think he's yep. going, you get your bit in it, right? And, you know, she went at someone and then we just recently had Dennis Shafabot Shapovalov had his issues in Washington, D.C. with a fan. And now Jordan Thompson has had his own issues with fans in Cincinnati. And a lot of this has to do with, in my opinion, guys that are betting on tennis. They've got it on their phones. This person recently um, did a whole thread of it on on Instagram, on uh, Twitter, saying, I'm sitting behind this guy and he's literally on a betting app right now. And so they feel like if you don't win a point for them, they have the right to now start abusing you and calling you all kinds of names, which is what they were doing to Jordan Thompson. And he took offense to it, as did Denis Shapovalov. What does the ATP, WTA, tennis in general have to do when it comes to fans like just yell out to players? It happens in other sports. We've seen it happen in baseball and basketball where players sometimes lose their mind. They run into the stands. Never a good idea. But right. what, are, what, are, what is the tennis associations going to do about this? <sighs> It's there's it's not an easy thing to handle. I remember playing matches. If win or lose, you know, you'd win a match and all players are going through this. You'd open your Instagram and you'd have 15 to 100 death threats sometimes of yep. it was always betters. And so, you know, betting is a big part of not only tennis, but other sports. And it's going to bring more revenue to the game. It's going to help increase fine. prize money. Yeah, it's great. But they're it's a hard thing to manage for the ATP or the governing bodies, but I think a lot of these fans or these online threats, you know, it's got to be one strike policies. If you, if you verbally say something or attack players, Hey, you're out of the stadium or you're out of the event, but then it gets to that point where it's, well, what's a, What's a verbal attack? How far can you push it? Cause if you just tell a player, Hey, you stink, like that's not that bad. He shouldn't get kicked out. So it's, it's a tricky situation The the, the tours, just need to monitor monitor it. Um, we don't want player. We don't want fans abusing players and saying nasty things to them. And as a player, you got to do your best to just not react to it and and calmly try to go to an umpire, go to a supervisor, and say, "Hey, this this person over here is not acting in a humane manner. Can we talk to them and and fix this situation?" But because it's a it's a nasty situation, like you said, and we're seeing it more and more. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I think there's at, at some point if it starts to become personal and a personal attack on someone and they're going at them because, you know, it had, as I said, it does happen in baseball and basketball, but it's so loud and free flowing and stuff is happening all the time. Whereas in tennis, yep. it's very quiet. So when someone says something to you clearly, obviously directed right at you, I think linesmen or lineswomen or lines people. Um, if they hear something like that, they should be able to go to the umpire as well and say this man is or woman is being aggressive or is being uh, derogatory towards a player and have security go and uh, remove them, period, end of story. I think that's the, the way that you handle it. And particularly it is always these guys that are betting on tennis and they just feel like they can say whatever. I mean, the abuse that players yep. get. I mean, I get it myself and I'm not playing anymore. I just get it if I comment on somebody in a commentating role and I get 55 people writing me on Instagram, which is just I'm just like, wow. You need to really get a life. Anyway, seriously. Um, seriously. All right. I did so some commentating side story last week for Tennis Channel. Come some of my first commentating. Yeah. I did the same thing in my, in you know on Instagram. You open it up. You're so horrible. I can't believe you said that. I'm like I I it's my second time commentating. I'm trying my best. Like what? Yeah. I've been that bad that I say anything that outrageous. Welcome to the world of uh, online abuse, my friend, for just uh, doing so, your job. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's always fun. All right, um, on a positive note, let's talk a little bit about what you think. Alcaraz Sinner, okay, or Alcaraz Djokovic, what's the better rivalry? It's not close. It's it's Alcaraz Djokovic right now. It's, yeah. it's not going to be here as long as Alcaraz Sinner, 
but I think especially the last year, especially with Wimbledon and the and the uh, the Olympic final, it put that as the premier, um, you know, Broadway. rivalry in tennis right now. And it's there's yeah. nothing better when any anytime those two are in a draw at the moment. I think every tennis fan is cheering for that to be the the final. It's like Fed Nadal from 15 years ago. We everyone wants Nadal Alcaraz. Sinner, as amazing as he is, he's just he's the third guy at the moment. And those two moment. have at the moment, at the moment, yeah. he's he's at going to get up there. It's going to be Alcaraz Sinner at some point in the near future. But Novak is is hanging around in, in such a big way. And it's uh those two going to the US Open, that's what everyone wants in the final, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's going to be – it's hard to say because the, the problem is everyone remembers what's just happened, right? So, of course, Alcaraz and Djokovic have played each other back-to-back -back big finals, like Wimbledon and Olympics. So it's like, of course, that's the rivalry. But then you get Sinner and Alcaraz when they play against each other. It's unreal tennis Every as time. well. So it's kind of like eh, – as far as I'm concerned, they're both incredible rivalries. It's like, what's a better rivalry, Roger or Rafa or Rafa and Djokovic? It's like they're both great rivalries, let's face it. just It's whenever they play, it's a great rivalry. Um, and that final was just, you know, it was just incredible. And to think, and this always makes me laugh right now, <clears throat> age is a factor, right, as we all know. Right. Um, and what's so interesting is that the uh, Olympics was best of three. And you know that if it was best of five, Alcaraz probably doesn't feel quite as nervous because he was really nervous in this yeah. match. I mean, he did not play his best tennis. And Novak was just himself from start to finish. He didn't really go up. He didn't really go down. And Alcaraz was a little bit up and down. But if it was best of five, you would, I don't know, you would sort of maybe even edge a little bit towards Alcaraz these days. And you would never have said that in the past. If it was best of five years, I was like, no one's beating Novak over five. But I think that's where the, the age factor comes in. He knows yep. that he can push himself for those two sets. And my God, there was one point in the tie break that was ridiculous. And I think it was in the second set. And I think even Novak lost that point. And I was just like, this tennis is, it's something else. It's yeah. just, I hope they can, I hope Novak plays for a, lot, a couple more years and that they play each other a lot more because it's just outrageous tennis. Same. And I said it earlier, it seemed like at the Olympics in the final, Novak empty the tank in his body after those yeah. two sets like totally. he need if he did not win that second set tiebreaker i don't know what happens to him but i i feel like the pendulum swings in alcaraz's favor in that third set in a big way but i yeah it is recency bias but i i want novak and carlos to play again at the us open final if we're yeah, gonna get too. the possibility of of another olympic final like that those are the two guys i want to watch playing well, it depends on the draw, so we'll see. All right, somebody that I did discuss um, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm, I've been pretty spot on with my picks uh, over the last few months, but uh, I did say that Naomi Osaka was a real threat at the US Open. Uh, but since that amazing match against Iga, which she had match points against Iga Shiontek at the French, um, she has not played well. And including just recently in Cincinnati, losing in the last round of qualies to Ashlyn Kruger. Um, and was seen, I know this for a fact, because somebody saw her walking down the golf course at Cincinnati because there's a golf course right next to yeah. the tennis courts with her water bottle by herself after the match. Like, what do we expect? She has gotten a wild card. It was announced, uh, I believe, yesterday or today that she has a wild card into the U.S. Open as a former champion. Of course, she deserves that. But what are your thoughts on Naomi? Because this is, um, to me, after what I you know predicted, is a bit – surprising yeah and after that loss to Iga Fiontech of the French Open where she showed she could play at that high level there's been nothing since then so she knows deep down she has that level to play with the best but she just can't find it right now and during my my limited commentating career which I started last week at the tennis channel <laughs> um, I actually called her match against Mertens uh in Mont in Toronto yes and she's just, she's redirecting balls at the wrong time. You know, she's yeah. finishing matches. She has 10 airs. She has 35 double faults. I think I also saw another stat when I was calling that match that she has lost now, I believe it's 20, maybe it was 21 matches in a row where she's lost the first set. She just lost the match. So like yeah. that fight and that drive to kind of dig down deep and find her, find a way to get out of some holes isn't there. And that comes with just doing it one time and knowing what that feels like. But she's... She's got to find – her game is there, like she showed at the French, but she's got to find a way to pull that out of herself somehow. And 
it's tough to do. I mean, you're a former player, you're a coach, you know how hard that is, but she's yeah. she's got some work to do right now. Yeah, there's definitely um, some work to do there, and it is confidence. And maybe coming onto the U.S. Open site where she's had so many great champ, you know, champion moments um, on Arthur Ashe Stadium and all throughout the grounds will just give her maybe that little edge to get over matches that she's losing in three sets and losing to some players. Um, you know, good work from Ashlyn Kruger, who then went on to win her first round um, in Cincinnati. So she's playing really good tennis, and she's a very good young player, coached by Michael Joyce. Um, so doing it, doing a really good job. Um, overall so yep we'll see where Naomi can go um who are your your picks at the U.S. Open just judging on I mean it's hard to know it would be nice to that Cincinnati would be finished we'll have a little bit better idea you know clearly I think if Sinner wins Cincinnati for me I've said Sinner's my favorite the U.S. Open even though he has not played well over the last couple months and he's had some injuries issues and just some bad losses for him bad losses um he's still my favorite um and I think coming out of Cincinnati we'll know a lot more but uh, what about you on uh, both the men's and women's side? Who you men, think? I'm favorites now. Alexi Popperin after the big upset. <laughs> and, <laughs> that was pretty, that was pretty amazing hey, for him to win that. I'm great. I'm so glad you said that because what an effort from him. Not only what an let's effort. Throw a little th- congrats out to Jess Pagula who backed up her win there last year. Right. And then Popperin, who wins his first ATP 1000. Great job. I saw him in Cincinnati. What a great kid. Works so hard. So congrats yeah. to both And he's of just kind of been floating around 60 in the world for the last yeah. five years. Had some big wins here. You know, yeah. has a lot of average losses and then put it all together. And he won that final convincingly over Rublev, two and four. But great job to yeah. him. Great job to Jess Pagula, like you said. Yeah. Who and, and Jess was kind of having somewhat of a similar year to Novak in her standards. And then she wins Berlin before Wimbledon. And now she defends her Canada title, winning Toronto. Yeah. I think she's back up to 12 in the race. It just... Jessica, Jessica Pagula's entire year just got flipped around, and she's yeah. now going into the U.S. Open. Speaking of kind of who my picks are, she's as much as a favorite as anyone right now, I think, yeah. to win the U.S. Open. And I'm going to go – you know, I'm going to take Pagula at the U.S. Open. I'm going to yeah. have her as my favorite right now. I don't – she's as deserving as any female player right now to win that. And on the men's side, at Nokovic, Djokovic or Alcaraz, I can't separate who I want to watch in the final with who I'm picking in the final. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, it's not I'm who just, you I'm want in the final. Who do you them. think is going to win, man? All right, I think I think Novak. I think he goes in with the least amount of pressure he's ever had at a tournament in his entire yeah. life. That could go both ways. He could maybe just bow out in the first round because he doesn't care. But what, there's nothing more he can do right now. And so I think he goes into the U.S. Open with. Just zero pressure, zero expectations, and that's going to free him up to a, a whole new level. And I think he might just run through the draw and win that tournament easily. Yeah, we'll certainly see. I mean, what else has he got to do? I mean, gosh, the, the for the first time in his career, as you said, he doesn't have pressure on him, which must feel so weird. But I feel like when you when you're that great, you always feel like, let's face it, you've got pressure on you. Right. Um, so we'll see. I'm 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 picking Senna. I have to stick with my pick, no matter what. Um, and I think Jess is a real shot as well. I mean, nobody's shining through. Rubakina, Sabalenka, Iga Shiontek, none of them are yeah. saying I'm the Coco's one. Coco's like struggling a bit Coco's right now. Coco's struggling for her. big time. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't even talk about um, her struggles, but uh, but you're right. There's no one really shining brightly on the women's side as to say, hey, what about me? I mean, Donna Vekic has had a great couple of weeks. Uh, Jasmine Paolini. I mean, the list is long. So. Where's Carolina Mukova? Let's put her in the favorite of the U.S. Open as well. Right. So, right. Like, there's, it seems like there's 15 females right the, now. That, I mean, the list is long. I so, can win yeah. this. But anyway, so so we'll see. We'll see. Um, you know, U.S. Open just a couple weeks away. Um, you know, I want to do a little quick rip, rap, rapid fire before we do this. Um, if you could travel back in time, one wish, one tournament, one match, one title that you could have won, Sam, what would it have been? It's Wimbledon. I mean, I I would almost think the answer would be the same for everyone. Wimbledon is, in my opinion, the biggest tournament in our sport. If I ask non-tennis fans, you know, my next door neighbor, name a tennis tournament, they're going to say Wimbledon. Um, I, I got to the semifinal singles, didn't quite get there, but that, that's the event I think you want your trophy case. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yes, absolutely, Wimbledon for sure. I mean, I, I mean, in doubles for me, I won Wimbledon a couple right, times. Right, you've got you've got the proof in your trophy case. I think it's so. You can't pick what you can't pick Wimbledon. You no, I had to pick the French because it was the one I didn't win. Um, and so there yep. you go. I lost in the finals a couple of the times, but um, but yeah. And actually, to be really honest with you, the French would have been great, but I would have loved to medal at the Olympics. Uh, that is one thing that's missing out of my little closet. Me and me and uh, not Novak anymore because he's got it. Um, <laughs> right. 
Yeah. Um, of you know, during the big three era, uh, there was a lot of players that didn't didn't get a grand slam because of those three guys. Um, but if there's one player that you feel like really missed out on getting a grand slam, who would you like to hand a trophy to? Gosh, I could say five guys right now. Um I'm going to I'm going to say three guys. I'm going to say Thomas Burdich, mm. David Ferrer, um, and Joe Wilfred Songa. Yeah, like all those guys were ranked between five and nine for eight years, maybe even more so Burdich and Ferrer. It yeah. seems like they made the quarterfinal every Grand Slam. I don't have the stats in front of me. But I bet yeah. the two of them made 25 quarterfinals of Grand Slams. Yeah. And they would just come up against Novak, Roger, or Rafa, And they those guys were just too good. But yeah. those are two guys especially that I feel like they almost feel like they should be in the Hall of Fame. But because the big three were there, they're, they're not even close to getting in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Well, listen, I know Andy won a US Open, but I would like to give Andy a Wimbledon title at least. And I would like to Andy Andy Roddick, I'm talking about. And I would love to see Andy Murray have had an Australian Open title. So they already they right. won Grand Slam, so I'd give it to them. I would say um also David um Nalbandian, a player like him who was so yeah. good for so long on all surfaces. But I'd say Ferrer. Yeah. I mean, of the guys that just hung around the top ten his whole career, never won yeah. a Grand Slam, just had that rafa in front of him at the finals of the French Open that one year. So yeah, there's plenty um and if you had a season uh, two of the french open uh, french uh, connection uh who would you have on your guest list first up who do we want uh it would be a joint get we'd have roger and serena on oh, oh. same time i like this this is exactly my I'm, thought i'm dreaming big right now but uh i guess yeah those two are my my two dream guests uh the, yeah I, I i thought of the same too or you have Rafa, Roger, and Novak just sit around and just talk about their stories yeah. about the. We just have a panel with like the five greatest players of all time. That's, exactly, throw that's Steffi what we want in there. For ep episode one, season two. Throw Steffi in there, um, but uh, of course, the, listen, guys, the Paralympics also don't miss out on them because they are coming up um, on Peacock and the, the the networks of NBC as well. So don't don't forget about the Paralympics because they're incredible athletes, um, and so hopefully you stick around and watch them on all the networks of Peacock. Hey, guys. July 26, we'll be back covering all the Olympics. Wait, hold on, in L.A. in four years. Uh, so, so I can't wait for the for L.A. to roll around. We saw the little promotion at the uh, closing ceremony. It's going to be slightly different to Paris. We're going to see a lot more beach, a lot more of Snoop Dogg, which is fine by me because he was classic. Throughout I actually, I live in L.A., so I'm already, I'm already seeing them, you know, the airport's getting a remodel. You're starting Ooh. to see like little signs of the Olympics coming. Even though it's four years away, you're, you're seeing some improvements starting to be made around the city. Oh, I like this for you. I like this for you. And I'm going to be at the, every sport. Will the transportation be decent? Because that was the first question I thought. How are we going to get around LA? I'll, I'll volunteer right now to be a tournament driver for athletes. Oh. If, if they want it. But I have no idea how they're going to get around LA. I'm going to assume, assume the transportation is going to be miserable. And then if it's better than miserable, everyone's going to be happy. Yeah, well, um, I thought about Beijing and the, the transport. Were you in Beijing? I was. I played Beijing, but the tennis, it was, fine, was, it right? not, it was like five minutes away from the village. The tennis yeah, got lucky with close. that. But remember, they shut down like the streets. And so they had lanes, particularly for like Olympic athletes. So don't worry, everyone. LA will be fine. They'll figure it out. I heard the transportation. They're going to really work on it. They're going to have the metro running. There's going to be lots of things. It's going to be hard because Paris, you could get everywhere super easy because of the yeah. metro. So uh, LA is not exactly the greatest when it comes to like figure it out. Get, get yourself on a bus. Um, but anyway, but Sam, you want to promote your podcast as well that you've got going now? I've got a new one with John Isner, Steve Johnson, and Jack Sock called Nothing Major. Um, and that's called that way because we none of us have majors. Jack Sock has some in doubles, but I'm sorry, Renee, we're not counting those toward <laughs> our title of our podcast. But it's been fun. We've got four out right now. It comes out every Friday. Um, it's kind of a lighter take on tennis. We're not necessarily breaking down the X's and O's. It's a, a more of a, a funny podcast. It's we are broken. talking tennis. It's a bro. We had Jeannie Bouchard on yesterday as a guest. She's going to be uh, on this week on Friday. She was an amazing interview, really fun. So, uh, yeah, check it out. If you if you want to laugh, listen to some tennis. It's called Nothing Major. Je Jeannie can hang with the bros. She's a bro, a bit of a bro fest. Oh, we grilled her. We asked her some, girl. we asked her some tough questions. 
and she was we played some fun games with her and she was hanging in there oh that's good yeah no no i coached jenny for a bit so i know she's definitely can hang with the bros that's for sure um and uh my podcast is the renee stubbs tennis podcast and that's probably what you're listening on right now so um uh, mine comes out every monday going from next monday on doing a little thing with iheart uh, radio so hopefully you'll tune into that but it's been a fun it's been fun doing this with you sam um it's been pl- nice playing a little mixed doubles with you through this yes. whole um little uh, french connection um and i've appreciated talking to you about all things tennis and seeing you blossom into this you know tv superstar on tennis channel as well and don't worry about the haters mate they're all over the place i've i mean superstars of, of a little it's nice of you to say that i've got some work to do before i get to your level the commentating's harder than people think yes um it's not easy but uh keep no. going you'll be you'll be great at it because you know if anyone follows you on instagram they know you how good your sense of humor is and follow him on his podcast with all the other guys but thanks for, um everyone we want to throw throw a big thanks to everyone behind the scenes of doing this podcast um we've enjoyed bringing it to you and uh you know hang in there with all of us through the US Open and of course all our podcasts and thanks everyone for joining us on the French Connection brought to you by NBC Sports and Racket and for now we're going to say bye bye see you later <laughs>